Uh, the Democracy Collaborative was established in 2000. We're a research, policy, advocacy organization. Um, our uh, interest is around the question of how do you rebuild the economies of communities in the United States in a way that's inclusive, that begins to address the fact that there are about 48 million people living below the poverty line in the United States, that uh, tries to stabilize jobs that are moving all around and undermining our communities. Um, so, uh, and, and really, ultimately, we're very interested in the question of how do you address the growing wealth inequality in America, which we think is uh, um, really a serious, serious problem for our d democratic way of life. And we believe the answer is more people should own capital, uh, that that would make a big difference. Uh, and I mean that not just rhetorically. There are actual structures of business and, and institutional arrangements, like cooperatives, like employee ownership, like social enterprise, that put more assets and wealth in more people's hands. And so we are very interested in the question of how do we move from the kind of ownership we have in America to more broadly own this economy. And we think uh, businesses like cooperatives owned by the people who work in them, who contribute their labor and therefore benefit when there are profits. That's a really smart way to begin to build business in America. In the United States, there's a really uh, rich ecosystem of cooperatives. Most people don't know that. Um, if you take all of the credit unions, which are cooperatives, and you take the uh, co um, uh, consumer cooperatives, big companies like REI, the outdoor equipment uh, company, which is owned by the people that patronize the business. You take the um, cooperatives that people own th who work in them and so forth. It's a f fascinating fact, but there are um, 130 million Americans in some way belong to a cooperative. And around the country there are many examples of really stunning cooperatives in the Bay Area in San Francisco. There's a, a network of five or six cooperatively owned businesses called Wages. There, it's a green eco co-op cleaning service run by women, mostly immigrant women, um, who decided they didn't want to be working for mi minimum wage by working for some you know, large company that does cleaning that you hire for your house. These women now are making $15 an hour. They have health benefits. They're owners of their company. The, the network's growing. Uh, there are taxi cooperatives owned by the taxi drivers in Madison, Wisconsin. There are uh, engineering cooperatives where high-tech kinds of goods are being made. And here in Cleveland, there's another expression of cooperative development that's called the Evergreen Cooperatives. So the uh, Evergreen is a cooperative business development strategy uh, based here in Cleveland. Uh, it's a network of companies in different sectors of the local economy um, that are owned by the people who work in them. It's part of a very place-based community development strategy here in Cleveland. Um, and the place is called Greater University Circle. It's in the heart of Cleveland um, and it's a very interesting dynamic. And it's this dynamic that led to the creation of Evergreen. And the dynamic is this. In University Circle, in this part of Cleveland, there is a, an extraordinary constellation of world-class cultural, health, and educational institutions. Um, firms like Case Western Reserve University, the Cleveland Museum of Art, the Symphony Orchestra, the University Hospitals, the Cleveland Clinic. These are multi-billion dollar institutions, world-class known, many of them around the world, like the Cleveland Clinic. They're called anchor institutions. They're rooted in place. Unlike lots of corporations that come and go in our communities, anchor, what are called eds and meds, the universities and the hospitals, tend to be rooted in place. They don't get up and leave, largely. Um, and yet these, these firms, and they're nonprofits that can't leave Cleveland, they're surrounded by six or seven neighborhoods with great disinvestment. So that today you have this network of multi-billion dollar institutions surrounded by neighborhoods of 50,000 residents, 40% of whom live below the poverty line. So there's this extraordinary anomaly, and this happens in cities all over America. Multi-billion dollar institutions 
literally billions of dollars of goods and services being purchased by them year in, year out. And yet all around them are these poor, disinvested neighborhoods. So, so the question became, how do we break down that barrier? How do we do a strategy that we called economic inclusion, that if, if one part of the community is growing and succeeding, all of them should succeed, everybody, including the residents, should succeed. And one answer for that was to start businesses that would employ residents of the community and have those businesses win contracts from these billion dollar institutions so that it drives money locally rather than leaving our community. And that was the genesis of, of Evergreen. It was really catalyzed, I, you know, the tribute should go, not to, I, I've been involved from the beginning, but the real um, acknowledgement for it shouldn't come to people like me. It should, it really resides with the Cleveland Foundation, which is the community foundation here that helped provoke this whole strategy, catalyzed it. Uh, the mayor and, and the city administration that's backed this year in, year out financially, and the anchor partners who have stepped up and really changed how they do business to try to support the community in a way that is frankly in their self-interest as well. Evergreen is, is a network of, of cooperative businesses, currently three of them, but the hope is to grow it to 10 or 15 or more over time. Three businesses, the, the sectors we're in, there's the Evergreen Cooperative Laundry, which is a commercial industrial scale laundry capable of doing nine or 10 million pounds of bed linens and sheets and so forth a year. Um, it, our customers are uh, local nursing homes in the community, uh, retirement centers, hotels here, uh, but also one of the big hospital systems. We're doing a couple million pounds of their laundry. Um, it's employing about 40, 45 people right now. Uh, it's the greenest commercial laundry, at least in Northeast Ohio, probably in the state. It's in a lead silver building and, and so it recycles its heat and water and so forth. And it's owned by the people who work there. Um, the second company is called Evergreen Energy Solutions and it's a what, it's a renewable energy and green construction company. It does large solar installations on the roofs of the big anchor institutions. They're trying to diversify their um, energy uh, supply. Um, we just did the largest ground mounted by we, I mean, of course, Evergreen. I wasn't out there with my hammer and so forth. But the, the employees of Evergreen, um, uh, just completed the installation of the largest ground-mounted solar field in any core urban area in the country. It's a six-acre site. There are now 4,000 solar panels on it. Um, uh, it will be switched on in July, and it will provide one megawatt, which is a lot, one megawatt of clean energy to one of the hospitals in the university. Um, and we're also doing LED lighting. We're retrofitting parking garages with LED lighting to cut the energy costs and so forth of these anchors. And the third company is called Green City Growers. It is, a, uh, again, the largest um, food production hydroponic greenhouse in an urban setting in America. Now, there are bigger ones out in the country, but not in downtown. Um, and on a 10-acre site, we've built about a three-and-a-quarter-acre greenhouse. Uh, capable in, uh, of growing year-round, which is important in Cleveland because it gets so bloody cold here, as I've learned since moving here, um, growing three million heads of lettuce and about 300,000 pounds of basil year in, year out. And it's all grown in hydroponics. It's grown indoors. Um, again, there are a lot of green features. About uh, half of the water that's used is captured from the runoff of the roof and recycled and so forth. So those are the first three businesses. So we're in food, we're in energy, and we're in laundry services. You know, there's a lot of misconception when people hear cooperative. A lot of people, what, what, what they interpret it meaning is collective. Uh, that is, uh, every decision is made by everybody. Like nothing happens unless everybody sits down and votes. And there are, in fact, cooperatives that run on the collective model. We are not doing that. So when you come into Evergreen, it's in many ways feels like a fairly traditional business. There's a board of directors, um, there's a CEO, there's a what we call a president who's the sort of managing director of the business. 
Um, there are supervisors and there are a lot of workers. The workers vote on certain kinds of decisions. Uh, for instance, to, be a, to work in a cooperative, you need to be a member. You know, to work in a business, you simply need to be an employee. But a member, what that means is you actually buy a share of your company. So each, mem each worker there has one share of the company. And, and they vote on who, who comes into the company things like that. They get to elect a couple members to the board of directors. But, um, you know, there's professional management, there's clear reporting, there's supervisors who come up from the ranks and run crews and so forth. So the workers own the company and, um, and that doesn't mean all the decisions rest with them. Um, what it does mean though is as these companies are profitable, um, workers get not only a living wage, which were Evergreen's committed to, and health benefits and you know, other kinds of benefits. We have a housing program to help move people into better housing in the neighborhoods and the like. But uh, at the end of the year, if there are profits, these profits are divided up among the workers. So it, it has the feel of kind of profit sharing. In a cooperative, it's called a capital allocation and everybody has their own account and money will flow into those accounts over time. And that becomes a kind of retirement fund or a nest egg for the future as it grows. I think that we're in that same period right now. That where the action is in America is not at the federal level, it's in the local community level. And what we're learning is what's going to transform the whole national system over time.